Good morning, everyone. I'm Eve Sullivan. Very happy to be here. Before I recap our discussion questions for the Doha briefing and introduce the panelists, let me give a brief welcome to those of you who are participating by webcast in Qatar, in our host home. I'll say salam alaikum and in North Africa and South Africa and wherever else you may be. I also want to say hello to my colleagues in the National Parenting Education Network. So let me recap the discussion questions for this morning. There are four. How can governments support parents and all family members, one and two, in nurturing, caring for, and socializing children? And three, how can governments support adult children in caring for elderly parents and support grandparents in caring for their children? Lastly, how can member states support civil society organizations in the above efforts? So let me introduce the speakers and we'll get started. First, I have the honor of sitting next to Her Excellency Sheikha Alia Altani, who is permanent representative of the state of Qatar to the United Nations. Next to her is Dr. Sharifa Al Mahdi, the new executive director of the Doha International Family Institute. To my right is Dr. Ron Ferguson, director of the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School. Next to him is Dr. Anis Benbrick, Director of Family Policy Department, Doha International Family Institute. And I believe Dr. Rashid Al Dosari will be represented by uh, Salim El Enezi. Nice to meet you. Um, also, we have with us Dr. Ignacio Socias, Director of Communications, International Federation on Family Development, and Dr. Renata Kazmarska, Social Affairs Officer, Focal Point on the Family. Social Inclusion and Participation Branch Division for Inclusive Social Development in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the UN. So first, let us hear from Her Excellency Sheikha Alia Altani. You. you have the floor. Thank you so much, Eve. Uh, uh, good morning to all, and I thank you for this opportunity, of course, to be part of this important discussion. Before I proceed with my opening remarks, I would like to, of course, acknowledge the presence of the newly appointed uh, Executive Director of the Doha Int uh, International Family Institute, DIFI, uh, Dr. Sharif Al Imadi. We're very much looking forward to working with you and collaborating with you in the future. And also, um, I would like to begin by recognizing my Qatari colleagues in the room, uh, starting off with His Excellency Mr. Ghanem uh, Khwari, of course, the Assistant Minister of the Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs and his delegation, and as well as I, my Qatari colleagues from the Family Consulting Center, uh, Mr. Rashid Al Dosari, and the uh, members of the uh, uh, DIFI Center in Doha. And of course, also welcoming Ms. Renata, uh, the social affairs officer and the focal point on the family in, in Dessa. Thank you all for being part of this uh, discussion today. Um, I would like to ex express again my gratitude and appreciation to the Doha Inter International Family Institute for leading this event annually since 2009 at the sideline of the uh, Commission on so uh, Social Development, uh, CISOCD, addressing each time a focus of their work in promoting the role of the family in social development. My sincere gratitude is also extended to our partners in organizing this in very informative event, the uh, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, DESA, and of course the International Federation for Family Development, IFFD. Um, uh, Excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt that positive parenting is import, uh, has great importance to the health, education, and overall well-being of children and for eradicating poverty and improvement of quality of life for, for all members of the family. Therefore, we strongly believe that supporting parents and caregivers to perform their crucial role in the family is key to the achievement of social development. Our event today is addressing the topic of parenting through the presentation of civil society statement on parenting, which was launched at the, at the meeting of civil society organization hosted by DIFI in partnership with IFFD in October last year. I would like to welcome, of course, our distinguished panelists 
who are present with us today to facilitate an important discussion around this statement and on the measures to be taken by governments to support the vital role of parents and on steps to promote the role of civil society organizations in the design, implementation, and monitoring of family policies and programs. I would like to encourage you all to actively participate in the following discussion to enrich this ongoing process with your valuable experiences and perspectives on the role of positive parenting in empowering family members to become active agents for social change and development. We're very proud that the Doha International Family Institute, based in Doha, has been recognized last year as a leading global policy and advocacy institute in the field of advancing knowledge on Arab families and promoting evidence-based policies. Please allow me to take this opportunity to, of course, welcome again Dr. Sharifa Al-Imadi and congratulate her again on her appointment. And I wish you all the best, and I look forward to a very fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Your Excellency. Let me now turn the floor over to Dr. Sharifa Al-Imadi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to speak in Arabic, so my speech will be in Arabic uh, as I'm from Qatar. <laughs> uh, um, um, Your Excellency, Mr. the Ambassador, and the permanent uh, representative of Qatar, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, in this um, a uh, side event of briefing uh, that is organized by the Doha International Family Institute, which is a member of the uh, Organization for Education and Social Development, and organize this meeting very annually and as a side event uh, at the Commission of Social Development at the UN. And uh, with me uh, today, uh, on this uh, 55th um, uh, session, uh, we have uh, the Division for Inclusive Social Development and uh, the IFFD. Uh, well, the subject of this uh, to this year, uh, w which is uh, how to give this briefing uh, the importance of parenting, and this is as an outcome of the Conference of Parenting, Child Warfare, and Development. Uh, that uh, conference took place on the October 24, 23 um, uh, in Doha, uh, with the sponsorship of Her Excellency Sheikha Musa, who is the president of the board of the uh, Qatari Institution for Education, Development, and Social Development. And this again with uh, UNICEF. Now uh, we are uh, discussing this declaration. This came uh, from uh, we consider parenting is um, is a cornerstone for uh, the welfare of the children of the family. This is not an amply slogan. Rather, it's a scientific uh, proven fact because um, uh, the parenting uh, really, um, uh, we can see it on all uh, measurements of an education, health, and uh, social integration. And we consider this parenting to be uh, is really uh, what allows the development and uh, makes him grow and uh, um, and uh, develop as an adult. And that's why we think that uh, parenting is really essential. And this declaration put the spotlight to invest in parents and the parenting education and how new policy could be developed uh, to support uh, the parents and uh, um, lays the foundation for good parenting. And uh, this is an effort uh, that we did with n nine organizations of civil society uh, that uh, are active in countries around the world. And, uh, uh, and, and they are the International Federation of Family Development, the World Family Organization, International Federation for Home Economics, Focus on Family Malaysia, Fathers in Africa, Negala Parenting with Confidence, European Large Families Confederation, and Parents Forum. 
in addition to this, w uh, with our partners from the civil society in Qatar, amongst them uh, the Center for uh, Family uh, Counseling, and Salim Adusi is representing, we worked with these partners uh, before the conference and also working on drafting this declaration and how to develop policies and recommendation and all of this constitute a framework to all of them uh, to improve uh, parenting and parenting education. And we got to this conclusion that we have uh, better investment for parenting, investment in parenting education, and make uh, this goal of uh, children welfare as um, um, uh, a present development goal, and also the presence of the father. This has been proven by many uh, social studies. And finally, we want to have this environment where all social organizations could be uh, part of this and could evaluate this policy. And at the end of my uh, uh, talk, I thank you for uh, coming here. And I'll be happy uh, to um, uh, present Eva Sullivan, and who is the co founder and the president of Parents Forum. And uh, she was part of drafting the declaration, and she will take on from that and be the moderator of um, the session. Um, uh, putting a spotlight, they, and Diffie, putting a spotlight on parenting, which has really been, in a way, in the shadows, neglected, um, because it's, it is important in education, health, and social integration. So. Uh, very big thank you to you and, and a welcome to you and your work as the new director of DFEE. Now I have the pleasure of turning the floor over to Dr. Ron Ferguson, who has done a great deal of work with parents in the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School, and has a new book out, which I'm sure he'll be happy to tell us something about. Dr. Thank Ron you. Ferguson. Okay. I want to talk. Um, First, very quickly about a project that we have to reach parents through the people that they already know and trust with five ideas, five clusters of parenting practices that capture most of what the scientific literature says is important for parents to do for the first three years of life. There's a lot of evidence now that a tremendous amount of brain development happens in those first three years and continues until students are, children are four, six, seven years old, but there's a period called developmental plasticity where the brain is growing rapidly, it's fluid, it's very responsive to stimuli in the environment, and then there's a transition to what's called adult plasticity where the brain still changes, people still learn, but it's a little harder. And so we want to, uh, capture all the benefits of this early period by having the interaction between children and their environment be full and, and rich. So the first three years is the focus of what we call the basics. It started with the Boston basics, but now we have affiliates in more than 30 other cities around the United States and a few people internationally using the same basic ideas. Uh, the first of the five basics is maximize love, manage stress. And the attention to stress is that emotional turmoil for parents or babies interferes with brain development. There's actually something you may have heard of called toxic stress, where too much stress actually undermines brain development during those early years. So we want parents to learn to manage their own stress, in addition to learn to express love uh, openly so the babies feel warm and secure. The more secure babies feel, the better they develop what are called executive function skills, which is self-control skills, the ability to make a plan and follow through, for example. The second of the basics is talk, sing, and point. Babies can actually hear more than three months before they're born. When they're born, they have already started to learn language. So we want to talk real talk from the very beginning. The pointing part of talk, sing, and point is associated with the idea that when you point at what you're talking about, the child more quickly gets an idea of what you're talking about, that, the, that words correspond to objects. So that's how pointing helps. 
uh, and talking real talk helps to build on the language acquisition that has already begun before the moment that they're born. The third of the basics is to count, group, and compare. Uh, many people count babies' toes or fingers, but we don't uh, think that much about comparing large things and small things and near and far and high and low and heavy and, not, and lighter. So all those comparisons help to build those parts of the brain that we need for mathematics. Playing grouping games with between four and ten objects, regrouping them, naming the numbers, helps babies catch on to the idea that numbers correspond to groups of things. They're not just words that we say one after the other. And so if a child is 18 months old, two months old, starting to play those grouping games can build a foundation for later mathematics. The fourth of the basics is explore through movement and play. We want parents to know that playtime is learning time, it's discovery time, it's not wasted time. So if parents pay attention to what their babies pay attention to, they can help to support the learning by talking to them about those things, by letting them handle and get the feel of those things, by supporting the, the understanding. And the fifth of the basics is read and discuss stories. Many people read to their children, but most people don't discuss what they read. And so when you're talking about an infant, uh, like a four or five months old, it's not really about reading even. It's about looking at the bright pictures on the page, talking with expression, allowing the child to hold the book. As they get older, two years old, it's about telling a story. It doesn't really matter if you're reading the words on the page. Just tell a story. Ask the child what they think about the story. Give them a chance to interact. That starts to build comprehension skills. So we have uh, videos, tapes, videos and handouts and other ways, materials to help us teach parents these things. And we want to reach parents through their doctors, through their religious leaders, through people in the community that they already know and trust. So as we build the structures to do this, we have to build connections into community-based institutions that are already there to have them be the delivery arm to reach parents with these things. So at some point, we want these things to become just a part of life. It's how everybody does parenting. Now, that's the first three years. The new book that we just put out is called The Formula, Unlocking the Secrets to Raising Highly Successful Children. And what we did for this book is to identify very, very highly successful people. About half of the book, people in the book were graduates from Harvard University. Other people are people that we identified out in the world who were just impressive, and we wanted to know how they got to be that way. So the book is really about how smart people get smart and how they get so purposeful and effective in the world. And we identified eight roles that we see over and over in the stories of these people's lives. We interviewed the people themselves. We interviewed their parents. And let me just tell you really quickly what those roles were. The first role is very much related to what I just talked about. It's called the early learning partner. It's the parent who interacts a lot with the child before the child is five years old, before they start school. And by the time the child starts school, they love learning already. They're hooked on learning. And not just learning, but problem solving. The early learning partner gives the child little things to figure out when they're like building with, with blocks or with other little toys. If they're reading a story, they invite the child to think and figure things out. So the child is a problem solver and often has, has started to learn to read by the time they start school. The second role is the flight engineer. If we think of, of life as a, as a flight, as a journey, and high achievers are on a really high flight through life, the uh, flight engineer is the parent who monitors to be sure things are going well at school and outside the home generally. And if it looks like the flight is going off course or the off track, that parent will intervene to hold the school accountable or to help the school to be sure that that child is kept on track. The third role is the fixer, which is the parent that makes sure that no opportunity is lost because of lack of resources. So this parent who's the fixer, even if the parent is poor, and a number of the parents we studied were poor, but their children still turned out to be super successful, even if the parent is poor, they will find some way for their child to have access to that important opportunity, especially if that opportunity is related to something the child is very interested in. The fourth role is the revealer, and the revealer shows the child life's possibilities. 
lets the child know the world is a lot bigger than our little neighborhood where we live. There are things to be interested in. There are things to do. There are types of people you could grow up to be. So it helps a child to identify what become their passion projects, the projects they're really deeply interested in. It helps a child develop images of possible future selves. They can see themselves in some of the people that they meet. So that's the fourth role, the revealer. The fifth role is the philosopher, who's the parent who takes the child very seriously as a thinker. Even the child might be three or four years old, but they ask questions and the parent thinks hard about the answers that they give. And they, t they talk to the child as if the child was a little adult, still so the child can understand, but they take the child very seriously. So many of the people we interviewed said, my parents always talk to me as if I was an adult. They um, help the child think about their own purpose in life. They help the child develop a sense of right and wrong and an understanding of why things are right and wrong. The sixth role is the model. It's the parent who conducts themselves in a way that the child thinks, I want to be like my mommy or my daddy, that they show the child how to do things. They model things for the child. The seventh role is the negotiator who teaches the child how to self-advocate, how to speak to more powerful people in a respectful way but still an effective way to get what they want how to behave in a way that other people will respect them and want to cooperate and help them. And then finally, the eighth role is what we call the GPS navigational voice. It's the parent in the child's head after the child has left home, that voice of the mother or the father uh, still coaching, still advising uh, long after the child has left home. So we find these roles consistently no matter what socioeconomic status or income level or race or ethnicity. These are the things people did. They did them different ways depending upon what resources they had, but over and over. And what our book does is it gives you all, the, all types of examples of, of how people did these things. And we weave in and out of the life stories of these people. So it's a storybook uh, at the same time that we have references to the relevant science and, and, very, and a rich set of examples uh, of how to do these things. So if we put together what I started with, the five early childhood basics, and these other, the ideas from the formula, we're talking about from birth through early adulthood. Um, but for a society to capture these things in policies, we have to build the institutional structures to reach parents and to reinforce and support those messages. So I'll stop at that. Thank you very much, Ron. I, I knew parenting was a big job. I didn't know it was quite that big. But I do recall my daughter-in-law talking to my um, grandson when he was six months old, and she'd have these long conversations with him as if he were answering. And she was already doing the things that you were saying. So I think the ideas are catching on, and certainly this event and your advocacy will, will help them catch on even more. So thank you very much. I did have the pleasure of reading the pre-publication copy of the formula, and it's, it's a very engaging read, so thank you. Let me now, let us now turn to um, Dr. Anis Benbrick, another DFI colleague who will have interesting perspectives. Anis. Yes. Thank you very much, Eve. I think nothing is left for me after the amazing uh, talk of Dr. Ron about his book and the formula. So I'd like to go back to the, to the statement uh, we did with our partners. But before, let me allow me to introduce the DFI, the Doha International uh, Family Institute. Uh, we are a global policy and advocacy institute working to advance knowledge on Arab families and promote evidence-based policies. DFI was established uh, by Her Highness Sheikha Moza bint Nasser, the chairperson of Qatar Foundation for Education, Science, and Community Development in 2006, and is an integral part of the foundation efforts to foster healthy, educated society uh, by strong, cohesive families in Qatar and the region. Our institute achieved its objectives by fostering knowledge on Arab families and advancing family policies and programs through research, promoting the development of evidence-based policy to strengthen and support families at the national, regional, and international levels, and building uh, networks and uh, facilitate the transfer of knowledge and best practices to strengthen uh, families. 
so I'll talk about this statement, and as uh, Dr. Shifa said, we worked it, uh, in 2018 with uh, uh, the partnership of our long-term partners, and we are proud to always working with the International Federation on uh, Family Development, IFFD, uh, 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 and other partners, I, uh, so I investing in children and their society, uh, World Family Organization represented here by Dr. Daisy, uh, IFFD represented here by Dr. Ignacio, Parents Forum represented here by Eve, uh, folks on the family in Malaysia, International Federation for Home Economics represented here uh, also there with us uh, today, uh, Ngala from Australia, Parenting with Confidence, Fathers in Africa, and the European Large Families uh, uh, Confederation represented here by Mr. Raoul. So uh, we had the meetings, uh, here I have a picture of the meetings in Doha, before uh, an international conference organized by DFI in partnership with UNICEF on parenting, child well-being, and development. The key message of the, of the meeting was parenting in many regions, include the Arab region, is generally taken for granted. Parenting is a private and personal affair. Uh, parenting is a, so, uh, is a social rather than individual issue when the narrative of child is used. Society's outlook should be changed instead of basing it on individuals, a family perspective in family in policy making needs to be introduced. Uh, another key message, there is a need to promote the importance of siblings within the family and to parenting. Parenting itself in many regions is facing many new challenges. Namely, there are new dimensions of poverty that currently affect parenting. The impact of new technology, social media and parenting, and there is a need for uh, uh, more efforts from different disciplines, including health, to tackle this problem. Uh, another key message of that meeting, the lack of communication, as Dr. Uh, uh, Ran uh, said, there is a lack of communication between parents and in, in their children in many regions due to changing norms. Uh, the, uh, the meeting also highlighted the important role of fathers in early childhood development and the need for evidence-based parenting education programs and collaboration between civil society, mayors, public administration, parliaments, regional government, municipalities, and international organizations to promote parenting education program. Uh, 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 investing in children and their societies promotes an integral approach through home ground services, coordinating with different sectors and ministry to target parenting. The, the key recommendation of the statements, we, we, uh, we have a, a couple of copies, uh, but you can find the statement uh, on our website, DFI website, translated in, in different language, English, Arabic, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Uh, the, the partner, the, uh, the NGO organization, uh, call all governments, national, international organization, academic, research institution, donors, and the private sector to support families, parents, caregivers everywhere by adopting policies that enable work-family balance, like flexible working and leave arrangements, parental leave, affordable and accessible and good health child care, an initiative to promote the equal sharing of household responsibilities, including unpaid care work between men and women, investing in parenting education program that address the different range of parenting needs and dimension, empower parents and caregivers to continue to build on their good practices while enabling them to adopt others that will improve children's health, development, learning, and well-being, and ensure they are protected, making the well-being of parents, children, and other caregivers explicit objective of parenting policies and programs while investing in universal positive parenting programs and services that are sensitive to the requirement of individuals, family, and the different needs of mothers, fathers, and other uh, caregivers. Recognizing the contribution and responsibility of men to families, developing policies to address the absence of male fathers on family well-being and promote active and present uh, fatherhood. Recognizing 
the valuable contribution of grandparents to parenting and investing in family policies and program that promote strong intergenerational interactions, such as intergeneration living arrangement and parenting education in an effort to promote inclusive urbanization, intergenerational solidarity, and social cohesion. Investing in research on families and parenting, program evaluations, impact assessment of parenting policies and program, so that the role of parents and their contribution to children's well-being and social development can be better understood by all stakeholders, and finally creating an enabling environment for meaningful contribution of civil society organization in the design, implementation, and monitoring of family policies and programs, removing barriers to the establishment work and funding of non-governmental organization. The meeting uh, uh, was uh, uh, organized before uh, the conference, international conference organized by DFI in, uh, in partnership with the UNICEF Middle East. And the key message of the, of the organization Overall, the family, specifically in Arab region, uh, encapsulate parenting, relationship, and functioning as a collective institution. Urbanization, changing gender role, and the changing experience of youth, and the increasing use of nannies in some countries are among the factors causing family system to change and adapt. Also, it is important to consider the relationship between family and other institution, and the role of policies and the provision of support of parent, and the main difficulty in adopting and promoting parenting education programs is the notion or the narrative that parenting should be private and personal issue. I'll stop here, uh, uh, then I'll leave the, uh, the floor for the uh, other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anis. I find the, um, the restatement of the statement always rich. I hear things when it's presented again that I hadn't heard before, and what struck me this time was the importance of siblings in parenting. And I recall my mother, long gone, saying that I should be sure to get along with my brother and sister, because I would be with them and in relationship with them much longer than I would be in relationship with her. And in fact, uh, she came to visit me over the holidays and here I am on the downhill side of life, still struggling with the fact that I thought mother loved her best. So one morning before even coffee, I asked her, so did mother really love you best? And she said the perfect answer. She said she loved each of us best. And I hope that every child feels that they are best loved. And that's what we want for parents to have the capacity to convey that reassurance along with all of the guidance as laid out. So with, with that thought and gratitude, let me um, turn the floor over to Salim El Enazi to speak, I believe, in Arabic and talk about the work of WIFAC, which is a wonderful institution in Doha. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First, I would like to uh, thank the Doha Institute and uh, and uh, um, give you the greetings of uh, Rashid Adousari, who was um, um, supposed to give this presentation, but he is under the weather, unfortunately, and we hope um, that he will recover soon. So we think uh, that um, this important of childhood is very important. We believe that childhood is the future and a way of to develop and a means of it. And that's why it's very important uh, to uh, focus on childhood when we talk about uh, social, any social, any society. Uh, and when the parents, uh, they are facing this, um, um, this, uh, this work to parent. Uh, um, so parenting uh, is a strategy to first um, try to diminish any neglect and on the other hand, gives coaching and, and uh, this institution uh, coaches parents to have a better uh, parenting knowledge and the skills to uh, have a positive 
um, interaction with Atfa. So a good relationship between parents and children is very important on the welfare and the development of the children. And parenting is uh, a worry uh, and a preoccupation for uh, the policy makers, for the educators, and the general public. So that's why uh, governments uh, around the world that actually interfere in the uh, relationship between parents and children that before was a private thing. And um, a very big component of parenting is a number of skills that we can train uh, parents uh, at. So uh, parenting, which is basically anything uh, that parents do and that uh, could uh, get intended or non-intended results on their development and their welfare. And this is a very important uh, on their development uh, for the preservation of society and the welfare of society as a whole. And from this point of view, we are uh, very much in agreement with many researchers that there uh, there is no greater responsibility than caring for the children, and there is no f function more important than uh, caring for uh, the youth. Many uh, scientific social uh, there are some parenting that could be very uh, harmful uh, for uh, the the physical and uh, psychological development of children. So there's some studies that ineffective parenting is one of the most uh, severe um, factors uh, that um, faces any negative um, involvement or development in the society. And this is based on samples on uh, children, teenagers that, uh, that came to um, uh, medical care and um, that all of this used uh, many uh, other scientific uh, measures, so any screaming and very contradictive uh, behavior, and that when there's not enough uh, supervision, is really uh, uh, leads sometimes to uh, drugs, to depression, to uh, stress, or a suicide attempt. And uh, also, there's um, a scientific research uh, of, of more than uh, um, the, the acceptance of parents that uh, the children, uh, they need some positive interaction and acceptance from the parents and uh, the persons around them. And, and when this need is not fulfilled in a satisfactory manner, manner so children around the world, uh, regardless of differences in culture and age or ethnic group or other factors, they themselves, they uh, tend to be uh, um, uh, very uh, harsh and, uh, and, and they have a very low self-esteem and they are not stable uh, emotionally, and they have a negative outlook on the world. And um, because parenting could be very harmful and could be, so it's very important uh, the, to stress the commission of uh, social development and childhood. It's very important for countries to uh, have policies based on uh, scientific proof. And that's why there is a need uh, for a policy to uh, support parenting in every country to, um, um, to better improve uh, parenting uh, inside and outside the home to guarantee a welfare of children. So uh, the participation of, uh, and the involvement in the parenting so, for example, lessening of any physical uh, punishment and be on the lookout uh, for uh, their emotional welfare. And uh, even though uh, the programs for uh, supporting parenting are very different, but it's very important from the beginning that countries that they don't have any programs on parenting that is general or more specific to some group, uh, it's very important that these programs be based on evidence and they are uh, based on two uh, standards 
First, uh, um, first is the participation of the children in the education of the children, and that these programs are adapted to the local culture. And with regards to participation of parents, that parents and children is always has a very good uh, re repercussion, for example, good self-esteem, better uh, educational achievement. But uh, uh, the participation of children and education is very, uh, remains very limited. So we have to diminish any barriers that are social or organizational that does not allow the parents to participate in the education and uh, with regards to um, adapting this on culture, that a firm parenting uh, that stresses uh, firmness, but uh, with uh, fairness and a capacity to negotiate is very, very helpful, uh, is more helpful than uh, just training the kids to be obedient. But other um, other studies on different ethnic groups that these results, we cannot generalize them. And they uh, use the social and ethnic and economic background of the parents. So therefore, we have to adapt a parenting program that uh, uh, that were developed in high income country with the different cultures and we have these programs should be adapted to improve the skills of parenting and improve upon them and uh, you know diminish bad parenting to have a good uh, environment where the children are more adapted to uh, their general involvement and they have welfare. And so our program on this uh, organization and develop. So in Qatar, we provide services, professional service uh, that has a good communication between parents and children, uh, even after a divorce, to uh, try to um, avoid any negative uh, effects of uh, such uh, the um, such event in the family. So that's why this organization, uh, we, uh, that the family would have an educational um, role to give the parents uh, this knowledge uh, directly or indirectly that are related to children and give them recommendations uh, how to better take care of them and how to safeguard them from any dangers. And that's why it contributes um, that to the goals of education to preserve the family um, unit and, yakun, uh, uh, and and there would be a positive interaction between parents and uh, and would be would that improve the welfare of children. So one more time, that uh, important and, and good uh, solid information is. A very important to make uh, parenting more uh, more of a pleasure and more uh, achieve more results and uh, get better results in their um, uh, emotional and physical and psychological health and thank you very much thank you very much Salim I think you reminded us that in fact um, while in most cases adverse childhood experiences are at a minimum. They are a fact, I think, of all of our lives. We've all had sad episodes in our childhood. And I think we have to recognize that parenting, it may indeed be a wonderful pleasure and, and a great blessing, and we want it to be that, but it also presents a constant stream of challenges. And because the challenges are often complex, we need support. And I think the work of WEFAC in providing support across the board to individuals and to families and to children, I did have the pleasure of visiting your center, and I'm, I'm very impressed and uh, wish those services could be available to, to parents in other locations. And in speaking of opportunities for support in other locations, I now turn to um, Dr. Ignacio Socias, Director of Communications at IFFD, and he will tell us about the work of IFFD, Ignacio. Thank you. 
very much, Eve, for your kind introduction, and thank you very much to the permanent mission of Qatar for sponsoring this event, uh, together with, of course, the Division for Inclusive Social Development of DESA. And once again, I should say that DIFI had the immense value of conceiving the idea of gathering all these organizations to show how important parenting is in our lives, in our society. I was, for instance, very pleased to see that on Christmas Day, the New York Times devoted part of its cover to this topic. Or a few weeks later, there was uh, this special report in The Economist on families in general and parenting in particular. So we can say that more and more parenting is becoming a verb we should use, we should value, we should consider as an important part of our lives. Of course, for us at IFFD, no need to say this is really important because it's what we deal with usually, with uh, helping parents to be better parents. With this very, very simple, uh, I don't know if I can show this better. With a very simple graphic, I wanted to show how important parents are for children's life. But I think that we really, after all the interventions we have had, we don't need to show that with a, a real family and with real parenting, children get what they need. While what this lacks, then it comes society, peers, media, and so on. And we see that a children grows up in a different way, not in the right way. But my point today is, is all kinds of parenting the same? And I want to turn into, yeah, thank you. I, can, I think I can manage now, into the civil society statement when it says that the scientific evidence confirms the importance of positive parenting. So this gives us a hint of what kind of parenting we should turn to when we want to help our children, our societies. Positive parenting practices and behaviors are beneficial for health, education, child well-being, and overall well-being outcomes for children and also for adolescents. This is something that the United Nations has been repeating during the past years. For instance, in this last resolution, on the International Year of the Family, uh, approved last November, when it says, initiatives to promote involved and positive parenting have been found to be beneficial in advancing social integration and solidarity between generations, as well as in promoting and protecting the human rights of all family members. Of course, this resolution comes from the report of the Secretary General that also mentions different examples in different countries on how positive parenting is working well. Okay, but then what is positive parenting? Without wanting to be really very exhaustive or very, even very comprehensive, let me just give some ideas of what I think mm, it's universally accepted. Positive parenting should be focused on the understanding that children come into the world primed with the tools and capacities to follow a path of optimal growth and development. I'm sure that most of you had visited Rome 
and had visited this very nice uh, Michelangelo's image called La Pieta. It is said that when he was working on it, someone asked, how are you going to figure out how to do this? And his reply was, the image is there. I only have to take out everything else. So I think this is a good approach for parenting. Not thinking that we should, so to say, make our children be whatever you want them to be. They already have the tools and capacities to follow a path of ultimate growth and development to be what they really are. So in that sense, we could say that the first characteristic of positive parenting is that it should be more focused on responsiveness than on demandingness. Second, let me just go through this table very, very quickly. Uh, positive parenting is, if we refer to this uh, common styles of parenting used. It's not authoritarian parenting. It's not permissive parenting. It's not neglectful, but authoritative. High expectations for self-control, high sensitivity, respectful of child's opinions, but also maintaining clear boundaries to help them not to get out of their way, not of our way. And then let me mention also secure attachment. Another concept which I think is very important has been developed a lot. <coughs> a close parent-child relationship with secure attachment is a sure sign of positive parenting. When there is this secure attachment, the parent makes a child feel safe, secure, and protected. And this is opposed to avoidant attachment and ambivalent or resistant att attachment to. And three more basic principles that I think we should consider when trying to help parents uh, and, and trying to promote this positive approach. There should be mutual respect between a parent and child based on the best interest of the child. You all know, I'm sure, that we will celebrate in November the 30th anniversary of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which basically promotes this best interest of the child, something that is often forgotten in many, many court decisions and even medical decisions. Second, parents should use natural consequences of the child's actions different from rewards of punishments. Uh, rewards and punishments are usually the quick way, the easy way, but not the efficient way to be a parent. And parents should let children do for themselves what they can, even with still inadequate efforts. Uh, if I may add to this something I've experimented along the world, the patience to wait children to grow up enough to make our eff their, their efforts um, really efficient is something very, very important because many times parents tend to do it by themselves instead of helping children learn their own way. So, what are we expecting with this declaration from the state? In my opinion, we think that when we find parents who are authoritarian or authoritative, or try to be authoritative, we need to prevent conflict. Prevention is very important, because quite often we see that once the, that conflict arises, in children or in parents, it's much more difficult to solve it. So preventing it is very important. And this can be done through parenting education, of course. 
the last um, resolutions of the UN have also mentioned it. Okay. So how much is doing every single state we want to reach uh, on parenting education? Uh, in the OECD, they usually say, in all these things, if you pay now, you pay less. <coughs> Investing in parenting education can save a lot of money for the future. But then, when parenting is very permissive, then there is this need for support. And parents shouldn't be replaced, but sometimes someone has to do something about it. And that's the state. And that can very well done through counseling. And third, when, really, when there are really neglectful situations, the state needs to intervene and sometimes even to institutionalize uh, children. But knowing this, that this is the very last step, because we also know that where children, with the custody of the children, has to be taken by the state, things don't usually go very well. So as parenting is a process, this prevention I'm advocating for now means not only accessing those who are doing it efficiently, but also reaching young people before the process starts. That is why some have suggested, and I think it can be a good idea, including parenting education in the official school or curriculum, for instance. Um, we, we were in another event this morning considering how young people usually, when they want to start a family, they have to face a lot of difficulties. Uh, time difficulties, money difficulties. And sometimes also that they don't know what to do. That's why in our federation we have started this course on personal projects, showing that everyone, every young man or every young woman should have a project for their lives. You can see more information about this there in this paper, and I think most of you already have a copy of it. This is one of our last issues on positive parenting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio. I so appreciate the work of IFFD and, and read with interest the, the sendings that you, uh, that you share with us. Certainly, positive parenting practices are not just one thing. They change with the age of the child and just when you figured out how to be an absolutely A number one ace parent to the little ones, then they turn six and they're different. And I heard a father say it's like watching paint dry to see their child develop. So patience is certainly a key factor. I appreciate that, Ignacio. We all need reminding of that. And I applaud all the panelists for keeping to good time and hope that our next panelist, Renata Kosmarska, has the time she needs to share with us. Thank you, Renata. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this initiative. Um, um, from my experience um, as a focal point on the families uh, since 2009, the parenting issues came up pretty, pretty early on in my work. And they were brought up by civil society. So I have to acknowledge the role of civil society of really bringing attention to these issues. And um, we already framed the parenting as one of the issues for um, intergen from the perspective of intergenerational relations when we, when we talked about the um, um, areas that were most important to advance the objectives of the International Year of the Family and then the 20th anniversary. Um, I recently um, did a search on the wor word search in the UN document database. So the word parenting can be found in 500 UN documents. When you put family as a word in the title and then you put fam parenting as a, as a word in the text, you only get 40 documents. Many of those documents are civil society statements. I am proud to say that the parenting appeared in the reports of the Secretary General that we drafted in our division. This is a contribution. And we were able to, thanks to different stakeholders, to 
have parenting and then parenting education mentioned in family resolutions, general assembly resolutions for the first time um, at, at 72nd session and then last session, 73rd session. The, 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 the framing is becoming, in the G resolution, is becoming um, more focused. So last year we had a focus on parenting education as such. Um, there were some questions when negotiating resolution about difference between parenting and parental, just to explain that um, the, the parent, parenting, um, when we, did, to distinguish the two, uh, two um, parenting from parent, uh, parental education, parenting signif signifies education about parenting. If we say parental, it may mean education of educating parents. So parenting is about education and how to be good parents. So, and, and about positive parenting, just to explain, it was a good definition that Ignacio said. I think for, from our perspective, positive parenting implies providing guidance and support for children in friendly family atmosphere, rather than using authoritarian methods and punitive measures. And we hear more and more about the positive parenting that helps prevent violence and strengthens family um, resilience. So at the UN, as you may know, we try to share good practices in family policy making. So we, we ask member states, regional organizations, UN agencies, what, what have you done in the areas that we indicate that were covered by the resolution? So I, I, uh, we asked um, for the past report of the Secretary General about um, also good practices in parenting education. And I'm happy to report that we got many examples of good practices. We got them from Europe, from Africa, from the Caribbean. Um, one of the interesting programs was, for example, offered in the Philippines, where you have conditional cash transfers for families, mostly vulnerable families. But in, in order to get the grant, the par parents have to attend family development sessions. And that aims to enhancing parental knowledge and skills. And they are held um, monthly and cover various child development issues. So I think this is, this is a great um, policy that can be shared and maybe other countries can learn from. This is one of our goals also at the UN to share those practices. Um, I wanted to bring your attention a little bit to an issue that was um, touched by Salim a little bit. But we also touched upon it in our re uh, report, last report. Uh, that's about disciplining of children. So um, we can observe that there's more con consensus that states have a role to play in bringing the end, end of um, violent disciplining of children. And this is an issue I think it needs more attention. And we can talk about it also in the context of Sustainable Development Goal 16 when we talk about inclusive societies and peaceful societies. So. Um, we have uh, we have some disturbing statistics on on the on the disciplining of children, and and we really there has to be more effort to help parents understand the importance of positive nonviolent discipline in child development and a close and effective parent-child communication, and that it contributes to the reduction of these harsh di discipline practices. Sometimes we learn them from our parents, and it goes on, and without um, assessing have they worked, what impact they have on the child. So, you know, this has to be reassessed. And another issue is the high level social acceptability of corporal punishment at the community level, not just the family level. So I think we have to deal with this um, at both levels. So uh, to leave some time maybe for questions and answers, um, I would like to conclude that there are a lot of areas to address under the topic of parenting and family policy, and I'm optimistic that we can work together on them in cooperation with UN agencies, including UNICEF, which is actually very responsive also in this area, um, civil society and member states to raise awareness and advocate for better policies in parenting education. Thank you once again for helping to raise awareness of this important subject. Thank you, Renata, and thank you also for for leaving exactly the right amount of time for questions. Just one little thing. I forgot to make it clear that my book is co-authored, <laughs> co-authored with Tatcha Robertson, who's a journalist and author here, who um, whose idea it was to do the book. So I just want to make sure I give her credit uh, for that. I also thought it'd be interesting. We the, the style of parenting that I talked about in the book is called strategic parenting being strategic and intentional about the, all the different 
uh, qualities you think your child needs to have. And it's interesting to combine that with positive parenting, I think a heavy emphasis is on the, is taking the violence out of parenting, right? And on um, being responsive. And so the strategic parenting is, has a lot to do with the content of that responsivity, right? The kinds of things, the, the revealer and the philosopher and the negotiator that I talk about. So I think these are very nicely uh, paired, those, those ideas when you put them together. Thank you. There's certainly plenty of work for all of us in various sectors and uh, various seats. Why don't I open the floor now and see if there are any questions that you would like to address to any of the panelists or comments that you might like to make sharing experiences that you've had in working with parents because we are a very prickly resistant bunch. We think we're doing just fine until we're not. Who would like to speak? Yes. Please identify yourself. Okay, I'm Regina Maroncelli. I am the president of the European Large Family Confederations and one of the signatories of this um, uh, briefing. Um, well, I, uh, talking about it, uh, the DOA briefing, I, I wanted to uh, point out how I appreciate the fact that, that even if we talk about parenting, we talk about siblings, um, because parenting um, uh, is a kind. Uh, parenting and ch children have a kind of a vertical uh, education, um, but among uh, uh, children, among uh, siblings, uh, there is this special uh, education that we call horizontal education that is almost uh, unknown uh, to academics and has to be studied, uh, but it's very powerful and it's a very good help for uh, parents uh, themselves. Uh, this is something that large family associations um, like uh, to uh, inform uh, people about because it's one of the uh, main value uh, of this um, ancient uh, family model that is a large family model. Uh, that is now very update uh, because it brings to society uh, those very precious soft skills like uh, empathy, um, teamwork competences, and sharing. Uh, so um, thank you for including siblings in this. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for mentioning horizontal education because that certainly obtains in parents form where peer support is key so brother and sister parents can help each other. Say a word on siblings? I just want to say a word on siblings. Uh, we found that it's often a really important um, influence in a child's life was another child who was two or three years older and it might have been a sibling, it might have been a neighbor, it might have been a cousin but if they were very intellectually academically engaged they became the role model and played roles that were very much like parent roles. Uh, in our book, we have a whole chapter on siblings and where we try to explain why sometimes only one child is super successful and the others are not, right? And it's because often one child really experiences the formula and the others don't. Um, also, sometimes one child is so successful that the others decide they can't compete with that and they back off and they stop trying, right? And so it's important for parents to be aware of the sibling dynamic and to make sure that their less successful children have as, as much support as their more successful children and that those children are inspired to believe in themselves and to still, uh, still do their best and have high aspirations, even if they think they can't keep up with the most successful sibling. Thank you for that. I, thank you, Ron. I think it, it is important that we try to dwell in a place of abundance, that there is enough for all of us, that if you get two scoops of ice cream, it doesn't mean that there's only one for me. I can also, in my mind and heart, get, get that scoop of vanilla ice cream that I chocolate chip. Who else would like to speak? Yes. Objective experience and research, SER, we are working on reconciliation, reconciliation as first step into peace and order and justice and, yeah, in a better life, which also um, concerns families. 
And uh, I'm really grateful for all those wonderful um, yeah, work you do. And uh, in my mind now is what is happening to those families that are not whole, that are broken. In our world nowadays, many families are lacking one partner, for example, for a child or for siblings. And this is a fact. So they need help. I think they, are, they should come into focus as well. Uh, that a mother that is uh, bringing up her children alone or a father that they are yeah, looked at too. Thank you. Ignacio. Yes, I think you brought a very interesting topic, as you usually do, of course. Yes, my vision of it is that the family problems have not been visible for many centuries. And we need now to make it visible to try to solve it. First, as I tried to say, by prevention, because we need to think that it's easier to avoid those problems before they really explode. But also through making the politicians much more accountable. I mean, social problems have to be dealt by politicians, by legislators, by lawmakers, yeah, but also by, by practitioners. And I think now I've been visiting in different countries social services officers, and they all say the same. We don't get the resources we need in this situation. So I need, we need to, to, to face lawmakers with this and try them to do something about it, even if the results won't be seen in the next legislative period, for instance, even if it won't bring them more votes for the next election, because this is a long-run problem that really needs to be faced. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Ignacio. Certainly, we do need people at every level of government and in all aspects, all sectors of society to take the long view because investing in parenting, in changing our ideas about the support that we need is a lengthy process, as, as we all know. Are there comments from, from others? We are closing in on time. Anise. Can, can I add something on uh, what you mentioned? One of the uh, idea we are advocating in Qatar is the targeting uh, parenting program. Uh, in particular, parenting compulsory uh, or mandatory parenting programs in case of divorce. There are many uh, best practices, many programs in the States and Europe where the court intervene or uh, court mandate parents to take parenting uh, programs in case of divorce, targeting uh, uh, parents themselves in, in a way to help them uh, have a healthy relationship after divorce, which will affect uh, children, but also uh, target also children uh, 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 to adapt to the uh, new uh, structure of the family. Thank you, Anis. I, I think time is, is upon us, and I guess as moderator, I get the last, last few words. I want to thank everyone who is here in the room today for, for coming and being part of this important conversation, especially thanks to, to Diffi and our hosts from Qatar. And I hope that we can all acknowledge the broken places within us because we all have those broken places. And there is a phrase, stronger in the broken places. And I hope we can all uh, come to recognize the strengths that, uh, that grow from adversity. to mention, or if to mention, that uh, as the parent mission of Qatar is sponsoring both events, this event and our event at 1.15, I think there will be some refreshments outside now for those who want to enjoy them. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>